So, good afternoon. Online with Garfinkel. So, the idea is uh, we're going to explore old authors, you know, theories that have been around uh, usually from the 20th century and examine the way in which they might be useful. We might be able to use them in research about online environments. And the idea, of course, is fundamental. Online environments are related, of course, to offline ones, but have a number of similarities that in many ways uh, they have a number of specifics and in many ways defy existing theories. Uh, and I'll return to that in, in, in a moment when I will give a number of examples. But uh, here, in this particular case, Garfinkel, um, while I was rereading it, or at least reading uh, an important part of his oeuvre that I hadn't read yet, helped me significantly in addressing a major problem, a problem that I think all of us have. And, and before we formulate the problem, I have to go back to a very widespread assumption that we use in the field of, uh, let's say, discourse analysis and social linguistics, linguistics very often, and that's the vector we use, and, uh, and I show the vector here. And the vector is from group to individual to language. So, for instance, we investigate French. So somebody is recorded speaking French. The French we hear and observe and analyze, we assume, is the effect of a speaker, a native speaker or non-native speaker, so an individual, okay? And the grammar as well as the modes of usage of that French is related to a group. So whenever we look at a, a, a specific little bit of language, we always have these assumptions with us. Now, of course, behind that assumption, there is an epistemological one that has to do with the knowability of these elements. So we know who the individual is. He or she is a speaker of, of French. Okay, and we also know things about the group. For instance, we call the group the speech community, or, or, or let's say the speakers of French. Okay? So the knowability about it. And so here is one of the peculiarities of online interactions. And all of us, of course, know them. We all know that uh, in the online world, there is no certainty exactly about who is interacting. It has to do, of course, with the widespread availability and use of avatars. Uh, so uh, on many, many social media environments, people never appear under their own real name, so to speak. As a consequence, there is no way in which we can know who the interlocutor is. All right. And here again, there is one of these peculiarities of online environments. A lot of theory about communication and about human interaction is built on the assumption of basically physical, uh, uh, say, visibility. Uh, so we're, we, we are within the same space, for instance, when we have a conversation. And so I can see whether you're a man or a woman. I can see whether you're old or young. I can see how you look. Uh, so there is this, uh, this idea, you know, that we can uh, observe each other while we communicate. Now, in this online environment, we don't have it. Uh, so there is no physical sharedness, let's say, of the space. And, uh, of course, you know, that creates all kinds of difficulties. So there is no knowability here of the individual or the group uh, in the way of an assumption. So whenever we say, okay, it must be a woman with whom I am interacting now, you may be very, very wrong. Okay, and, and actually there are no ways, at least not within the normal ways of using, uh, uh, let's say, these, uh, these instruments, very few ways in which you can actually uh, know who is there. Right, so this is one element. The second thing is the resources. All right, we, we, we know that online interaction, or at least some of the features we see there, is distorting our established notions of language. Okay? Uh, for instance, the idea that language, also theoretically, has to be addressed primarily as a spoken thing. And most of what we see in these online environments is not spoken. It's basically scripted. And so here as well, what is the nature of resources? And also the nature of the interlocutor, of who is there? We have no certainty. And I think that's a very, very big problem. We only see effects when we do research. All right? So whenever we, we observe, for instance, chats on social media, uh, we basically see identity effects. So we believe we, or at least we start building an image of who is there on the basis of what he or she does. Okay, so we have effects there of actions. 
And we also see meaning effects. So we see effects of the resources. Okay? While the resources themselves and the individuals as well as the communities with whom we are establishing all of that are hard to know. But we have effects. And so here is the, at least in my view, a, an issue of considerable size in the field of methodology. We don't have much in the way of mainstream assumptions uh, in doing analysis, in doing research on online environments. But we have one or two things. And notably what we have is we have actions. So what we can observe are observable actions that are performed within specific environments. Okay? Uh, an infrastructural environment, so the online environment is an infrastructure and has a number of affordances. We also know about the algorithmic effects and so on and so on. But we have actions. And that's the only thing we, we are actually really certain about. So what we can observe are actions. And so I was looking for a theorist of action. And it brought me to Garfinkel. But before we get to Garfinkel, here is a little bit of the sort of general uh, uh, approach that I myself use. Okay, So this was before Garfinkel. This is where I was before I engaged with Garfinkel. I had established basically four principles, methodological principles, that are also based on this assumption of the, the, the uncertainty we have with respect to who's communicating and how. Okay, so like the, uh, who are the communities we are engaging with when we go on Facebook, when we go on a number of other applications, all right? Uh, and so uh, it all starts from what we have, and what we have is interaction. Okay, so we, we, we can see modes of communication, all right? And we, of course, know that every moment of communication, as, as long as it is meaningful, uh, involves relationships, a meaningful relationship, literally a relationship of meaning, okay? And I think that's pretty unshakable as a principle. These relationships, we also know, will, will always involve identities. So whenever I engage in an interaction with you, we create identities. I create an identity for myself, and I create one for you, and vice versa. Right? So that will always be there but it will always be interactionally established. Always be interactionally established. Just to give you an example, one of the things that I very uh, regularly hear, for instance, when I engage in uh, social media battles on Twitter is, that is very subjective being an academic. Now, here's an identity qualification. I'm supposed to be an academic and not be subjective. So here is the interactional negotiation and establishment ratification uh, of identities. And that's the second principle. Third one is, now of course, you know, these identities lead us to degrees of groupness. Groups can be very small, two people, they can be very, very big, millions, all right? So uh, there is a sort of automatic uh, relocation from the individual identity to a group identity on the basis of sharedness and recognition. And now finally, of course, in general, uh, there are very different modes of interaction. Like, you know, when I'm on social media, uh, it, it heavily depends in which role I, 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 I approach others. I can ask a question or I can give an answer. Those are different forms of interaction. As a consequence, you will have all kinds of, uh, let's say, very different effects there. So those were the, the principles that I myself wanted to elaborate. And now we get to Garfield. At least, yeah. So here is Garfinkel. Garfinkel is dead. He, uh, well, very many people are dead, by the way. Very, very many. More than, you know, the people that are alive. Garfinkel was a sociologist, okay? And most of his work needs to be placed, located in uh, the early 1960s all the way until the 1980s, early 1990s. Now, he was a peculiar kind of sociologist, very often called micro-sociologists, all right? And he himself very strongly identified with Schutz, Alfred Schutz. So here we are close to phenomenology, 
So Schütz was, was a, 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 a pupil of Husserl, but strongly influenced by Mead. So he had to go to the United States and he became very strongly influenced by George Herbert Mead. Okay. So in a way, what Schütz represent is ethnographic phenomenology. But he also became a member, or at least, you know, he was never, uh, how should I say, outspoken about it, but he was a member of a movement which is now known as, you know, symbolic interactionism, and a number of other names that you relatively frequently hear from me, you know, people like Sikurel, but also Goffman, Bloomer, and so on, were also there. Uh, now, he specifically, so Garfinkel specifically, is very often seen as the precursor of a a more widely known branch of analysis, conversation analysis. However, he himself was always very um, unhappy about that, and I, I will also get into some of the reasons for that later. Now, he was a very special guy, radically empirical. So if you read his work, uh, it, is, it is aridly factual. Uh, it's also written in a very austere way. It's boring, in other words, okay? Uh, hard to read, he developed uh, a vocabulary that is really arcane, you know, and, and basically has no resonances in, in any other body of, of theoretical work that, that already existed, and he continued that. Yeah, so he also never uh, became influenced by other people, all right? I mean, he must have been influenced, but he never acknowledged it in, in the shape of adopting, for instance, notions from somebody else. He rarely did that very much a man of his own, and also eccentric in the sense that he definitely was not mainstream. And so he created something very specific, uh, highly isolated basically as a development, uh, and of course, you know, the longer he continued to do that, the more marginal it became, all right? Uh, and as a consequence, these days, his work is hardly ever read. If you try to read it, you, you easily understand why. If, if you want to assassinate your students, uh, well, assign uh, some um, amount of Garfinkel to them, which is why I talk about it, so you don't have to read. <laughs> now, uh, he himself identified very strongly with a thing we now call ethnomethodology, okay? Ethnomethodology, and it is ethnomethodology that is now very often basically presented as the precursor and in many ways even, you know, something that should be similar to conversation analysis. But again, he was insistent that was not that. Now, just a note on the word ethnomethodology. The ethno there has nothing to do with, uh, uh, let's say, ethnic, okay? It means local. So from within a, a community of users. And a methodology is a method, all right? Uh, and it refers to the way in which in our everyday lives we ourselves create a sort of logic, a sort of rationalization uh, of all sorts of routines we do. Okay, so for instance, if I would ask uh, any one of you, why are you not making notes now? You would have an answer to that. All right? A rationalization. And uh, uh, he would say you have an ethno method. But his definition he himself gave in the only book he ever wrote, 1967. So there have been a few editions of his work later. Um, and the editions are brilliant in the sense that there are very good introductions by Anne Rawls, who is an absolutely magnificent scholar, and she reads in a readable uh, way. Uh, so she makes that very dense, uh, weird and eccentric system that he developed very accessible. She also places it within a very good intellectual context, and so on and so on. But he himself, this is how he, he defined ethnomethodology. It's an investigation of the rational properties, note already what he means by rational here, of indexical in, uh, of expressions, so speaking, and other practical actions, so not just speaking, not just conversations. Here's the first qualification. As ongoing accomplishments of organized artful practices in everyday life. So he focuses very strongly on order, right? So the way in which in our, in our everyday life, in almost anything we do, we try to bring order, and we do that in relation with other. I've given two footnotes here, basically because this is written in 1967, okay? 
and a number of the words that he used in the meantime have uh, uh, been open to all sorts of interpretations that need to be qualified. When he, uh, for instance, uh, uses rational, it actually means reasonable. So not rational in the sense of, for instance, rational choice theory or formal logic. No, it is everyday rationality, rationalizations. Okay, and they can be true, they can be untrue, they can be strong, they can be weak, but we usually have a sort of rationality in the sense, why are you not making notes? Well, it is because, okay, so we have a sort of logical relationship between one thing and another here. And is that what he means by rationality? It's being reasonable. Okay. The second thing we need to, uh, to observe is the notion of indexical here. What he actually means is situated meaning. So meaning that is contextualized. So whenever he refers to, to uh, the indexical, okay, as a domain of meaning making, it actually means the actual situated moments in which we make meaning and we produce meaning in relationship with others. So these two qualifications are important in order not to misread what he means there. So ethnomethodology. Now he has a number of very important, let's call them intuitions, that he follows you know, throughout his work. And I give them here. And you will already see some of the vocabulary he uses as well, so go through them. Uh, so he sees social order, which is his main concern, as a locally achieved social fact, local. So in other words, we live in moments, right? But in moments, in local enactments of social order, you can see the big things. So we observe a detail of everyday life, and you basically see social structure, if you wish all the way through that detail. It's the only way in which you can see social structure, he argues. It's on the basis of local enactments uh, of the big things you know, that we believe are, let's say, the stuff of society. Right? Another thing, very, very important, and he's not alone in this, eh? so for instance, Goffman and basically all the symbolic interactionists also share that. He puts action first, all right? and individuals and groups after that. So basically, he sees the individuals who are doing the actions as just the local staff. It sounds a bit shocking, eh? but the essence of what he says is we have to look at action, and it is from action that we will begin to see the individuals, who we are, all right, and also which groups we, we, we make. And he gives a number of very precise indicators as to how this works. Notably, he says, and, and here's you know, that vocabulary that he designed, actions have what he called autochthonous order properties, meaning they have a, a number of features that are specific to the actions. So here again, uh, uh, this notion autochthonous has nothing to do with you know, allochtons, autochtons, and so on. It, it means ethno, local, and highly specific. <clears throat> and they are the features of what he, call, uh, of what he called, and, and I find that a very, a very inspiring notion, congregational work. What is congregational work? And so here you have the second uh, explanation. It is the work that we do with others for no other reason than because of the fact that we are with others. So in other words, it is work that we do collectively just because we're not alone. Okay? And here's a very old intuition that goes back to Mead, but also to Schutz and so on and so on, which is the idea that, of course, we behave very differently when we're alone but than, we, than whenever we are in the presence of others. Now imagine you, you know, when you have to give a lecture uh, uh, at some, uh, say, international conference, in the morning of your lecture, in the hotel bathroom, rehearsing that lecture. And usually it's brilliant, absolutely <laughs> superb. In the afternoon, however, when you have to really deliver it, you're uptight, you're nervous, you know, you, 
and you freak out and it goes completely wrong. Eh? So this is a difference, a very elementary difference that he indicates here. And here he has a word for it. Well, a number of words, but the most important one here is the idea of congregational work. So we do a lot of things when we are in the presence of others because we are in the presence of others. And for no other reason. Okay. And in that sense, groups are made by the actions that the members are involved in. So groups emerge out of what people do. So in his vocabulary, groups emerge out of congregational work. I will give examples, so don't worry, uh, in a moment. Now, how do they emerge out of these actions? And again, here is a very, very basic principle. It is through the simple effect of recognizability. So whenever we communicate with others, the others will only give meaning to what we do when there is a degree of recognizability in what we do. And it can be the same thing, or at least, you know, I can recognize an action on the basis of what you wanted to convey to me, and then we understand each other, but I can also recognize it as an entirely different thing. And then we misunderstand each other. But there's always this dimension of recognizability whenever we communicate, all right? And it is recognizability that creates the social formats, and here is another word that he, he developed, formatting, the formats that we believe basically create order in everyday social life. And, and then, of course, you know, the formative, uh, uh, sorry, the, the formatting is reflexive in the sense that there are no external rules. It's basically us who do the formatting ourselves. The classic example he gave was this, a queue, a queue. Now, all of us have, have been in a queue ever in our lives. Now here it is an organized queue, you can see you know, these, these lines, but even here, so there are no lines. So you could expect that people would congregate in a different way here. No, we do not do that. We know how to make a line, all right? And even when there is no sign, like you have to queue here, we will automatically do it. So the moment we see more than one individual lining up in a particular way, we know how to do it, and we begin the congregational work. And we become a community, right? So here you see social order being generated in a very, very specific way on an everyday basis, all right? And it, it is real order, also in the sense of being rigidly organized. Now try to jump in here. If you don't believe me, try to jump in here <laughs> and say, well, you know, there is a space here. I can, I can get in. A try. You will instantly see that the queue is very important. Hey, hang on. The queue starts over there. Okay? So it's not an arbitrary thing. It's not a light thing. It's actually a very, very big structure in society that we see here. Okay? And as a footnote, uh, when I'm in a queue, I don't very often engage in conversation with other people. All right? Those were the examples that he addressed from the viewpoint of ethnomethodology, all right? There is no conversation going on here. So those who say that ethnomethodology is equal to conversation analysis, he was violently ob objecting against that because it's just one aspect of action, all right? And reducing all of this to conversation means, you know, that you've missed 90% of what is going on. So in that sense, a little qualification that I would like to make here. Uh, is this clear? So here, those, these individuals are uh, doing you know, congregational work. They're forming a queue. The queue is a form of social order. It's recognizable. So you see the other people, and you recognize these actions as being a queue. And so you automatically know how to do what you want to do. But you know that you have to stand here and not here. Okay, and usually you also know that you have to wait, okay, and until you are at the front of the queue, and most of the times you also well, do not immediately engage in intricate conversations, like, you know, this guy, of course, is looking at the smartphone, eh? which is what many of us do when we're, we're in a queue. If you go to an airport and you have to queue up for security, that's exactly what you see. Eh? 
So we know how to organize our behavior in particular formats, all right? And it is because we do these formats congregationally that we form identities. And so here you are somebody identifiable by others, right? So your identity is very, very clear uh, and also recognizable, socially recognizable. Okay, no questions so far? That's Garfinkel, ladies and gentlemen. Can you, well, there's a little bit more to him, but uh, that's the thing that I would like to highlight. Because uh, now the important thing is here, look at actions, not at people. Okay? At actions. And it is on the basis of looking at actions that we begin to understand how they become who they are. All right? So how individuals as well as communities are being made. Okay? So let's look at actions. And now we go online. And I, I, I would like to highlight, I mean, basically just two examples. And a number of you know them very well. Like the first example is extremely well known to Gosha, uh, who wrote uh, with me a paper on it. And it is the notion of you know, context collapse widely used in uh, speaking about social media interaction. And essentially it stands for the idea that uh, in, uh, or let's say, on social media, for instance, Facebook, we don't really know who is there. And so we are writing something like an update, but we don't know the addressee. And the effect of that is that we become uncertain, we can be misunderstood, or others whom we don't know may use our message, you know, to produce meanings that we don't like. And so there is anxiety, identity anxiety, but also communication anxiety. Okay. <coughs> now, when we started working on that, Gosha and I, we, we, of course, I mean, the first observation you make is that there's a very, very simple range of assumptions about communication. Uh, notably, this idea that communication is, I talk to you, you talk back to me, then I talk back to you, etc. Like an, an, an ordinary conversation. Okay. While, of course, on Facebook, and, and uh, no doubt elsewhere as well, there is a lot more going on. And, and here's the thing, um, an old idea that, that somebody whom I, I used to know quite well, uh, Charles Goodwin, would always reiterate, he would always you know, say, now he was an, a student of Garfinkel's, uh, and also one of the most prominent conversation analysts, but a good one, good win, good one. Um, uh, and he would always say, whenever you think that there's only one thing going on, look again and you will see many more things and the example he always gave was the notion of conversation itself so we have just one word for a thing we call conversation now within that conversation all sorts of different things may may be done for instance there might be moments in the conversation where we engage in a narrative so i tell you a story okay there might be moments in which I become very subjective and emotional and others where I'm not. There might be moments where I lead the conversation and others where I basically follow the conversation. And so all kinds of different actions and we, want, we only have one word for it, namely the conversation. And it is essentially what we try to do here, you know, Gosha and I, in this particular analysis we did, we try to look at what they exactly did. Okay, uh, and of course the case was a very, very long, um, what shall we call it, discussion on, on Facebook. A particular, uh, a particular Facebook page made for uh, migrants, but also resident people from, let's say, Poland, working and living in the Netherlands. Okay. Uh, the particular example we looked at was um, a long thread and it went on for five days. It involved 65 people and it went over one, 192 uh, moments of action. So responses, comments, and sub comments, and so on. That's so 192, so really big thing. Uh, it was initiated by a journalist, a female journalist, uh, who was making a docu or an item on the exploitation of, uh, uh, of individuals working on farms in the Netherlands. And so she was asking basically, is anyone interested in helping me out uh, like, like for an interview or some information because I'm looking for uh, well, basically people who work 
within this industry and who have been exploited or are being exploited. Now, what happened was an explosion of, uh, of, of interaction uh, going in all sorts of directions. Uh, so, yes, of course, there were people who said, yeah, I, I know all kinds of things about it, so you can always contact me. And then they moved to personal uh, messaging. Uh, but there were others who said, you know, she had written some autographic uh, errors in her initial message. And they were attacking her, saying, you don't even write good Polish, how can you be a journalist, and so on. It went all over the place. Also, people started bickering amongst themselves, and so on. Now, here again, we have only one word for it. It's a discussion. But this is what they actually did. So once you start looking at the... The, the real actions that they did, this is what you get. So here's the central action. So this is the journalist, oh, sorry, here. This is the journalist asking a question, okay, and she gets a number of direct responses to it. So suggestions, like you should look there or you should go there, a number of, of individuals who volunteered. And in that sense, it was a success. But all kinds of other things on her question were made. All kinds of actions were about her question. So were not on her question, but about the question. Right? So not responses, but basically meta comments about the questions. Lots and lots of things. Good ones saying, great question, at high time you devote some attention to this issue because it's a very big issue. Negative ones like, what are you talking about? You know, why don't you just work? Etc. Etc. Uh, all sorts of opinions. Well, I think you know that these people who work at Burp and went on and on and on. But there was indifference, like WTF? Why do we worry about this? Uh, and also false accusations, like you must be working for the intelligence service if you ask questions like that, and so on. Now we're all familiar with that, eh? So we, we've all gone there. Then you had the first line of, uh, of replies that were actually constructive, but all sorts of other things happened here. She was also being trolled, especially on the issue of identity, like, you don't write good Polish, are you Polish? All right, and are you a journalist, and who are you, etc., etc. And, I mean, normal trolling went on. And the trolling itself became a huge network of involvement and actions in itself. You had people attacking the trolls, you had also people uh, just basically standing up uh, in her defense, like saying, leave her alone, you know, she's just doing her work, and so on and so on. And then you had the trolls going back to these people, the trolls being attacked by individual people, and so on and so on. So one of the things we, we see here is that a Facebook discussion well, of course, it's vastly more than that, right? It's an uneven, unequal, highly fragmented network of related, not very related actions, okay? And they form one event. So highly complex, highly complex uh, notions of events, you know, need to be applied here. It's non-linear, so you can't find the usual A, B, A, B here, yeah? and also not question, answer, question, answer, no, no, all sorts of other things went on here, uh, yet they did it. So 65 individuals engaged in this network of activities, and all of these activities have a structure, okay? So all of these activities have a structure. Those who were responding to the trolls were not responding to her. They knew exactly what they were doing, the trolls as well. So when they got back to it, they also knew exactly what they are doing. So what we see here is not one set of norms, but an enormous array of different norms for interaction being deployed. The congregational work is basically spread over like 11, 12, 13, 14 different actions, all of which are recognizable. And it is on the basis of the recognizability of actions, all right, that you begin to see how individuals make sense. So everything we observed was highly, highly, highly fragmented, complex, I've already said that, okay? But yet people managed it. And they were able, like here in this particular case, to maintain one interaction while that interaction was being interrupted by all sorts of other things. 
okay? And they were able to go back to earlier interactions while they were uh, also maintaining an interaction here. So here in this particular fragment, uh, halfway through or, or a little bit later in the interaction, or at least in the so-called, well, let's say discussion, eh? you see three or four different conversations occurring at the same moment and interlocking, all right? And nobody got it wrong. They knew exactly what they were doing. So one of the things we see here is that basically the notion of what we call context, all right, is essentially, or at least uh, uh, we may see it as a recognizable, meaningful action format. So you recognize what the other is doing, and it is on the basis of this recognition that you organize your own action, even if it is not in line with the previous one. So you follow the action, you don't follow the threat, so to speak. So here, in a way, we have a very operational notion of, of contextualization. And then when it comes to the central issue, we address the context collapse. No, it's not collapsing at all. You see that people are doing very intricate forms of contextualization all the time. And they are basically driven or grounded in the recognizability of specific actions. Okay, so here is a central notion, context collapse. Uh, what we found is basically context expansion. Nothing is collapsing, it's expanding actually. People do it all the time and they find their way through. But we needed to walk away from this old idea of interaction that had been used as the, the central assumption in the other research. So we had to start looking at actions itself. And that's the first example. The second example I mentioned earlier, you know, the, the, the the uncertainty we have with respect to resources, but the fact that we could see effects of, at least meaning effects of a number of resources. And so I, I got into thinking, let's have a look at hashtags. The hashtags, of course, are uh, new, at least in the way we use them now. They, they're completely new and highly specific to social media. And so they are a new, a new emblem, a new icon, a new symbol. Uh, let's have a look at it. And I looked at one particular hashtag, a hashtag which is called Just Saying. It's well known, we all use it. Uh, I, I very often use it experimentally, so I also try it out. Eh? And it is known to be, well, not connected to a particular theme, but more a sort of indicator of a particular stance, a key. I'm just observing, okay? I'm not making any judgments, I'm just saying it, all right? So I'm, I'm not really uh, like being negative or, or whatever. No, 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 I'm just neutral. So that's how it is usually described. And what I tried to do in, in the analysis of a number of examples in which the hashtag uh, had been used, I mean, a good number of examples basically, but I will highlight one is I tried to blend Garfinkel's action perspective, so the one we have already explored, with the notion of frames as developed by Goffman. Are you familiar with that? Mm -hmm. Frames as, you know, ways of organizing experience. Um, and so I tried to see how the action that had been enabled or triggered by a particular hashtag, i.e. just saying, may be connected to framing and reframing. And here's the example that I would like to illustrate. I don't know if it's very readable. I translated it. It was a Dutch, um, a Dutch exchange. Um, the first participant is the mayor of Antwerp, uh, who's a pretty right-wing man, not known to be, uh, how should I say, very open-minded uh, when it comes to gender issues and so on and so on. But, uh, well, he was... He was absent, he was brought on the day of the Pride, the Antwerp Gay Pride Parade. Okay, but he tweeted, uh, uh, you know, like, well-wishing. Okay? So my, my, my greetings to those who participate in, in, in the parade, uh, being yourself safely, and, well, he, he 
a lot into law and order, so being yourself safely, all right, and freely, of course, that's what matters today. Okay, uh, no, no hashtags here, interestingly. So he really doesn't want to get involved in, into the debate, the larger debate about it. He triggers a lot of responses, of course, and here are some. Uh, so one of his um, immediate respondents, number two, uh, well, in my view, might belong to his political angle, rather conservative. And he says, I find the cultural promotion of extra natural behavior not suited for a conservative party, i.e., you know, the mayor's party. I have nothing against uh, the LGBTs, I have something against those who attack them, you know, the bashers, but also against publicity. Okay. And he continues, so he answers to himself, which is not unusual when you know, people go on a rant. I grant everyone their freedom, but I find the promotion of, and again, counter-natural acts entirely unacceptable. And then he gets a reply from another guy. Let's also prohibit publicity for traveling by plane then, because humans don't fly. And here you see just saying. So, okay. Now what happens after that is this. So number two gets back to him, a little bit more aggressively even. There are less people throwing up when they see a plane than people feeling sick when they see homosexual acts. Upon another reply, another reply, and it escalates a bit, as is not unusual uh, in these kinds of interactions. But here's the important thing. So you have this particular hashtag and a number of moves that basically create a completely different interaction. And now let's have a look at how we can structure that. What we see here, and, and here are frames, is basically very intricate reframing. All right, so what the hashtag does, so let's say this was going on. And so you have the, uh, the mayor of Antwerp who speaks to everybody, one to all, okay, on a particular topic. And he gets likes and retweets, you know, from, from a relatively big uh, sort of community, out of, out of which one engages in a one-on-one -on -one response to him, okay, like saying, I don't like the way you give publicity, you know, to, to homosexuals being the leader of a conservative party, okay? And a number of others, of course, like that, etc., etc. But this one here introduces an entirely new footing. So he shifts it away. An entirely new way of addressing this. And what we see here is everything changes. So not just the theme, okay, but also who participates, all right, and also the general way in which we communicate. So what we see here is a massive shift, not just in the theme, all of a sudden it's about flying and homosexuals and so on, no longer about the gay parade, okay? No longer about the mayor and his conservative party, no, it's about not a thing. It involves basically two people, however, they also get all kinds of likes and, and so on and so on. So especially this one becomes quite popular, you know, it gets lots of likes and retweets, etc., etc. But they are dyadic now, and they are aggressive. And so this, this, uh, this, uh, this, this opening shot by the mayor saying, you know, let's uh, be ourselves uh, safely and freely, that's what it's all about, is completely gone. This here is a 100% uh, indexical reordering that has happened. is annoyed. Yeah. But participant three, I mean, just saying is basically yeah. annoying someone. It's yeah, just, it's sort of hiding yourself behind, well, I'm just, just saying, but you know you're sort yeah. of poking someone. So in a sense, they're both yeah. annoying. So, so what so we see, what we see is it's a framing device. It recreates an entire frame. So if you ask what just saying does as a hashtag is, it enables massive reframing. And it usually does. So when you try it in like a heated sort of debate and it has been going on about like for instance you know the climate uh, here in this country or immigration so just try to use it and you will see what happens it's but a complete reframing because it's still annoying 
right? It's, it's annoying. Yeah, but that's the key. Uh, that's the key. The frame is the complete organization of the interactional work that happens. And that's the framing. So what we see here is the framing, at least the frame is what I call a chromatope. It shifts the chromatope entirely. And all sorts of different things are being redefined. The theme has disappeared, there's a new theme. Those who are involved in it are also redefined. So it's me and you and then our respective, let's say, followers who like and retweet and so on and so on. And the, the, the mode in which we interact with each other is aggressive. And so this is the massive indexical reordering you see. And it creates a sort of uh, byline, if you wish, uh, an entirely different range of interactions within and along the main ones, let's say. And it goes on and on and on. This one went on, of course, for, for quite a while. And that's what I mean with reframing. And so this enables massive reframing. And so here's the question. We don't know a lot about resources, like hashtags. What exactly do they mean? Uh, we can see effects. And it's on the basis of effects, i.e. actions, right, that we see what they enable. Now, most hashtags have a framing effect. But I'm not yet, I'm not yet entirely through uh, you know, with that. But just saying is a really interesting one. Just you know, try it a few times. It's uh, it's hilarious in a number of cases. It always triggers highly peculiar, uh, you know, responses. Yeah, I would also be interested how often there is actually a follow up from the person just saying. But because I think the just saying is ideal yeah. for just poking. Yeah. And then oh, I was just saying, and the sort of the aggression of the other is yeah. basically just well. You know, there are very good memes uh, about just saying, in which you mm -hmm. see somebody saying, um, I'm now writing just saying instead of you stupid asshole. <laughs> so it is a way, of course, to say, well, yeah. uh, what the hell. Huh? So yeah. in that sense, yeah. yeah. It's a rhetorical device, more or less. A framing device. Yeah. Uh, but again, framing, what exactly happens when we do framing? We do a lot. So it's, again, not just one element that is, as is shifted from one point to another. It's, it's, an, it's an arrangement of the entire, let's say, format of interaction. It's the breaking of the queue, okay? Here's the queue, and here you have a number of people who jump it or step out of it or do something else, or start chatting to each other in a queue, so i.e. violating the rules, if you wish. They are doing entirely different congregational work. And frame one disappears. Yeah, or at least you know, uh, on the on what you see, mm -hmm. it of course uh, basically coexists. So this becomes embedded within the larger Twitter discussion. Okay, but that's an artifact of the technology. Yeah. The social actions that we see, you know, uh, are being fractured here. You know, through the reframing effect. I'm just saying. Okay. Let me conclude. We're almost there. It's all very straightforward, isn't it? We have seen uh, in the beginning, you know, that there is a, a very long and old and established tradition of using a particular vector, a sort of uh, even uh, not really theorized, but pre-theoretical vector in a lot of the study of interaction. So we start from a group to individual to language. Now, what Garfinkel helps us to do is to simply reverse that vector. We start from interaction, and then we move to individuals and groups. So we reverse the, the order. It has enormous effects when, when you start thinking about identity and how identities are used in social research and in humanities, where we almost always will start from here. For instance, when we go sampling, all right? So we need a number of individuals with these characteristics, a number with the other. Yeah. Before we can start using language. Now here, of course, you start doing an entirely different thing. And it is basically uh, emergent out of these actions that you get individuals and also groups, communities, and so on and so on. And here is what Rawls writes on, on uh, our old friend Goffman. He also had 
this assumption, all right? That the individual, the self he calls it, is not the point of departure, okay? Uh, and in many ways, it's a very unsafe a priority, a very uh, risky priority. When you say we know a priori who the participants are, he or she, a man, he or she, a woman, he or she, young, he or she, old, black and white, Muslim, non-Muslim, all right? And then we're going to analyze how they interact. He warns us against it. So he says, hey, 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 let's first look at action. All right. After which we shall see how these identities and these, like even, you know, the features, the actual features of identity are being made on the basis of this interaction. So now for me, uh, here is the principle that I now use, who people are online, knowing that we don't know exactly who they are. Well, it emerges out of interactionally ratified, i.e. recognized congregational work. So it is when we engage with each other that we very, very quickly uh, let's say start making an idea of who the other is. And very often these ideas are, are relatively accurate. Eh? And, and here's the methodological upshot. We are now able to be a lot more precise and sure when we talk about online identity remarkably by not using them as a priori but as effects and that's when we can be sure not when we use it as an a priori and as a story for today i thank you very very much and i'll leave you with a few announcements <laughs> thank you so the announcements next week uh, i've already mentioned it earlier